Uh, so we all convene uh, people from outside. Yeah, we are clapping. Please come if you're interested in listening. Um, there was some confusion about time of restart, so we are two minutes late now. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Venus first uh, talking to us about CP violating inflation. Um, you have. 25 minutes plus five discussion, and after 20 minutes, I give you a five minute warning. Okay? Perfect. Thank you, Tanya. <coughs> Apologies, I've got a bit of a scratchy voice. Um, thanks so much uh, for the organizers. It must be really difficult to uh, organize a hybrid. Um, I guess, would it be possible to maybe mute the. Um... Yes, indeed. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for um, that. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so um, this is a work that I've been doing with my collaborator, Kimo Tuominen, um, in Helsinki. Um, and it's uh, based on a work that is going to appear in PRD and work in progress. So um, let me start with the very basics, the standard model, which uh, time after time uh, has been proven uh, to agree with experiment with the many particles that theoretically it predicted and then experimentally were discovered, with the last particle being a Higgs boson. Um, as well in agreement as the standard model is, we know that it's not the complete theory of nature because there are many aspects of nature that the standard model um, fails to address. Um, the ones that um, I'm going to um, base my talk on or um, the fact that there is an insufficient amount of CP violation in the universe to produce the observed amount of uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry. Um, the fact that the standard model doesn't have an inflationary framework in a satisfactory way and the fact that none of the particles of the standard model are suitable dark matter candidates. Um, this list is not um, exhaustive. There are other problems uh, with the standard model, but these are the ones um, that I will be focusing on, mainly the inflation and the CP violation one. Um, and clearly, uh, to address these shortcomings, one has to go beyond the standard model. And with the scalar sector being the um, least uh, constrained experimentally, um, this is the sector that I'll be extending and trying to address these issues. Um, yeah, so there are many um, scalar extensions of the standard model that aim to address these uh, problems, uh, such as the um, scalar singlet of the standard model. Uh, but such a simple extension um, runs into many problems because, uh, well, by construction, you can't induce CP violation in, in uh, the scalar potential uh, with a singlet extension. Um, and um, if you want to provide a dark matter candidate from the model, because it is the one portal coupling that dark matter has with the standard model, um, you will run into tension uh, when you try to reduce the value of this coupling to agree with um, non-observation of the dark matter candidate, but at the same time, you need this coupling to be large enough to agree with the relic density observations. Um, so this model is quite um, constrained. The next, let's say, step would be to add a scalar doublet on, on top of the standard model um, scalar sector. But in a doublet extension, you can't introduce CP violation and dark matter simultaneously um, to basically um, impose a symmetry on the mo model that would stabilize your dark matter candidate. You uh, rule out the possibility of intro introducing CP violation. And vice versa, if you introduce CP violation, then you won't have a dark matter candidate. Um, the, the one extension of the standard model, which um, I love, is um, basically a three Higgs doubler model, which was originally suggested by, by um, Steven Weinberg. Um, and the justification was, you know, we have three families of fermions, why not three families of Higgs? And I guess um, the original idea must have been that you can then um, translate the fermion mass hierarchy problem into a hierarchy between the waves of the doublets. In any case, um, the CP violation, um, CP violating inflation mechanism that I'm going to discuss today 
is um, realized in the three Higgs double model uh, with an extended dark sector, which also um, provides you with a, a relic density, uh, sorry, with a dark matter candidate with correct relic density and in agreement with all um, observational and experimental data um, with a CP violation that is basically not limited by electric dipole moments. And um, as I will show you today, also gives you um, a satisfying, let's say, inflationary uh, mechanism. Um, these models are not just theoretically very interesting, but also very, um, a lot of uh, current and upcoming um, experiments um, can uh, probe these models. And in the interest of time, uh, I'm just going to uh, get into the main issue, which is um, inflation, um, which is, as uh, we've heard many times today, uh, one of the basically uh, best motivated models of um, early universe, the inflationary period that we have. And um, one of the, again, best agreement with observation inflationary models is the slow roll inflation, which basically um, predicts a, um, a scalar field called the inflaton, which um, rolls down its smooth potential. And at the end of inflation, when the inflaton has arrived at the vacuum, um, it basically dumps its energy into the standard model particle uh, during a period that is known as the reheating phase. Um, so the simplest basically inflationary model um, of this type um, is the Higgs inflation, in which you um, basically uh, ask for the standard model Higgs uh, to also be your inflaton. Um, but this model ru run in into uh, some problems. Um, the main one is that uh, you see the scalar potential in the standard model is quite um, limited. And um, at high field values, it is the quartic coupling that uh, derives the behavior of the, of the potential. Um, but for a slow, slow roll inflation, you need this potential to be flat um, enough, especially at high field values. And um, as we know um, in the standard model with lambda H um, value is, uh, which is around 0.12 or so, um, the potential is certainly not flat. One thing that you can do um, that would flatten your potential is basically allowing for a, a, what we call a non-minimal coupling of the Higgs field with the um, Ricci scalar. Uh, then basically this coupling is called the non-minimal coupling to gravity. And um, by increasing this, um, this C value, you can flatten the Higgs potential. But in the Higgs inflation case, uh, because uh, lambda H is, has a very large value of uh, order 0.1, C has to be very, very large um, of around a thousand or so for your potential to be flat enough for this lateral inflation to work, uh, which then uh, kind of is kind of an unnaturally large value and runs the, um, the model faces um, unitarity problems. Um, and um, basically, when you put an inflationary model together, then you have to um, adjust it based on the observations. And um, the main one comes from this plot that you've seen many times, uh, which is basically the constraint that the uh, Planck experiment has put on this tensor to scalar ratio R versus the primordial tilt or the spectral index NS, which are, um, um, basically derived or calculated from your inflationary potential. And basically you need to be um, yeah, around here for your inflationary model to um, agree with observation. Having said that, uh, let me tell you about this um, three doubler model scenario that basically accommodates the CP validity inflation. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many motivations for um, three Higgs doubler models. And especially this setup that I'm going to use uh, now is um, a Z2 symmetric three Higgs doublet model in which uh, the one doublet basically plays the role of the standard model Higgs doublet and has an even Z2 symmetry, uh, Z2 charge, um, very much like all the other standard model particles. But these extra two doublets that I'm adding 
or doublets that don't uh, acquire an expectation value. So they're usually referred to as inert doublets. Um, and uh, they're odd under the Z2 symmetry, uh, which are the only particles basically that are odd under the Z2 symmetry. Um, so uh, let me tell you about the benefits of this Z2 symmetry. Uh, one of them is that um, when you introduce extra um, scalar doublets into your model, um, they, they can couple to fermions and you run into the problem of predicting flavor changing neutral currents, which have not been observed experimentally. So you have to justify why uh, your model, well, it, it shouldn't predict um, such, uh, such currents. And usually what you do is that you impose a Z2 symmetry on the, on the model in which in this case, for example, you, um, because of the Z2 charge of the fermions and the, the scalar doublets, it is only the one doublet, the one that I mentioned plays the role of the standard model Higgs doublet that couples to the fermions, which means that you, your model won't be producing flavor changing neutral currents. But also if now I introduce CP violation between these doublets that don't couple to the fermions, um, I won't have any contribution to um, the electric dipole moments, which are the main experimental um, constraint on uh, CP violation in beyond standard model um, frameworks. Um, and this symmetry, uh, as I mentioned, is imposed on the full Lagrangian is respected by the vacuum. Um, so for the purpose of inflation, I'm not uh, showing the charge fields here because they don't um, affect the inflation dynamics. And um, basically you see that I've got these two uh, doublets with the four neutral states in there, uh, which are going to contribute to inflation. And uh, basically I can rotate one of these fields of, away. I have that uh, kind of freedom um, in a unitary gauge. And um, let me quickly show you then the potential, which is obviously extended and you can write it as uh, two parts. The part that is basically phase invariant, uh, which means that all of the parameters in the potential are by construction real. So you don't have uh, any option of introducing CP violation here, but there's also a part of the potential which basically ensures that your potential is only Z2 symmetric. And the parameters of this part of the potential can uh, be complex and uh, therefore give you sources of CP violation. So this is the one source of CP violation, but the other source is um, in the non-minimal coupling of the inflaton fields to gravity. So basically when you write the action of your model in the, let's say Higgs inflation case, uh, you have this non-minimal coupling, but uh, in this specific case, your Z2 symmetry also allows for a term of this type um, whose coefficient could be complex. Um, so in what I'm going to show um, further, the notation that I always use is that uh, for each parameter to have you know, its magnitude and um, I suck in the phase um, in this form. So you will be seeing this theta one and theta four as they appear in um, the observables of the model. So, um, so I've put the potential together uh, and you, you do the, the standard uh, thing that you do with a Starobinsky type uh, potential. Um, in this case, because I have these extra fields, I do a bit of a simplification where I write uh, these extra fields in terms of H1. Um, uh, again, these uh, kind of dependencies could have, uh, could be time dependent and um, space dependent. Um, and then, well, the full numerical potential and how you minimize it and find the direction of inflation is something we're working on right now, but analytically, uh, in this uh, simplified form, um, we know what the inflationary potential looks like. Also, uh, once you've kind of uh, having written all these neutral fields in terms of this H1, then this H1 is going to be your inflaton field. Um, but um, you can also using a transformation parameter from the uh, Jordan frame into the Einstein frame, uh, you can also write this inflaton field in terms of this, um, what I call A tilde, which is the reparameterized inflaton field. 
Um, and then you do what is usually done, that you write the new inflationary potential in terms of this new reparameterized field. So in the Hicks inflation case, uh, the inflationary potential would look basically like this, but without this X function where I have sucked in all the uh, contributions from the um, extended potential, uh, which are also where the CP violating phases are. Um, so then for um, exemplary values of this theta one and theta four, I uh, plot the potential and you see that very much like what you expect from a slow uh, potential, it is flat at high field values. These values of um, A tilde uh, correspond to very high field values uh, for H1. Um, and then at the end of the inflation, where the inflaton rolls down to the minimum of the potential, you see that the behavior of the potential is very much slow roll like. Um, so we check it with the observations and you see that um, in fact, for the usual number of e-folds that one considers for an inflationary model, um, the, uh, scalar, the tensor to scalar ratio and the spectral index predictions are exactly um, in agreement with Planck observations. Um, here's one important uh, winning point that this uh, scenario has uh, in comparison to, let's say, the Higgs inflation is um, when it comes to um, predicting the uh, scalar power spectrum. Um, so you see the scalar power spectrum is also, um, is, uh, you, you calculate it from your inflationary potential and uh, the WMAP ob observation has given us a very good, uh, basically, limit on um, the predictions of your model for PS, for the scalar power spectrum. In the Higgs inflation model, uh, this uh, basically equality, it tells you that this C, the non-minimal coupling to gravity, should be around 1,000 because you only have the one quartic coupling here. Whereas in this case, because the potential is extended, um, well, not just because the potential is extended, um, which would allow you to um, basically uh, go for uh, much smaller values of lambda, which are in agreement with uh, theoretical uh, constraints on the model, uh, but also you have these uh, two CP violating phases, theta one and theta four, which then allow for your uh, non-minimal coupling to gravity to be as low as the conformal value. So here, for example, uh, I'm showing the three sigma bands of the PS predictions in our model for a fixed value of theta one, but changing values of theta four. And here I'm showing the C4 value um, for uh, basically in a plane of theta one and theta four. And you see that your C4 values could be very, very low. Um, so one of the original motivations for this, for this setup was basically to, um, to do baryogenesis. Um, and um, yeah, I wanna see if uh, these uh, new sources of CP violation, theta one, which is basically coming from the scalar potential and theta four, which is coming from the complex coupling to gravity, um, the idea is to see if we can transfer this phase uh, to the standard model particles. And basically, if you look at the, um, well, the exit from inflation where the doublets acquire an expectation, uh, initial expectation value, um, and you look at assuming instant reheating where the inflaton basically decays quickly um, to phi three, which is uh, basically the field that um, is going to be your standard model Higgs-like uh, field. Um, what, what we do is, um, well, I'm showing the result for just an exemplary um, tree-level process of phi one decaying to phi three star, phi three star, and a one bubble uh, diagram, which takes phi one to phi three, which then decays to phi three star, phi three star. And then we define uh, an asymmetry um, as, the decay width of the tree plus loop process of phi one decaying to phi three. And we see that it is in fact, um, or indeed proportional to this um, alpha, which is uh, alpha is by the way, uh, dependent on theta one and theta four. 
Um, so you see that, yes, in fact, we do produce an unequal number of phi three and phi three states. Um, and our goal is to then transfer this asymmetry to the standard model fermions via leptogenesis or baryogenesis or so, um, which is a work that is being done now. Um, but uh, yeah, at least we've got a non-zero asymmetry. Um, and with that, let me bring to you to my conclusion. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm perfectly on time. Um, and here I've decided to just give you a one slide summary in case you were basically uh, drifted off during the talk. Uh, the idea was basically that I have three Higgs doublets, one of which is the standard model Higgs doublet, and the other two are going to contribute to inflation. Um, and in such a case, I can introduce uh, complex couplings in, in the potential and also uh, complex couplings in the coupling to gravity. Uh, and then these two sources are going to give me um, not only an inflationary uh, potential, but also an unequal number of particles, which I will be using for baryogenesis, hopefully. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, thanks uh, a lot um, for this uh, nice talk. Are there questions? Maybe first on Indico. Oh, sorry, Indico Zoom. Um, yeah, Nicolaus, please go ahead. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, comprehensive talk. We have to speak louder. We don't hear you. Sorry. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? I can hear yeah. you, yes. Okay, thank you very much for this nice talk. Nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask if your z symmetry can be broken slightly, so as at the end of uh, inflation, uh, inflation, some of the scalar physics scala produce, produce domain walls, mm -hmm. which could then collapse and produce uh, gravitational waves that would survive as they would occur at the exit of inflation. Have you considered that possibility or uh, Well, actually, I, I didn't want to break the z symmetry because exactly it would lead to, uh, to domain walls. Okay. Um, but yeah, the reason, um, as I said, original motivation was that we studied this framework for a, a what we called um, uh, CP violating dark matter case. Um, and I realized later on that, okay, it's not only in the scalar potential that I can introduce CP violation, but also in the non-minimal coupling to gravity. So the whole idea started with, uh, okay, this is, we basically have, let's say stable fields. Uh, that right. could play the role of dark matter for you later. Okay, that's okay. perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I don't see any hands in on Zoom. Are there questions in there? So I don't ask the question. Okay, one second. Thank you. Uh, you preferred um, your model to Higgs inflation because uh, the Xi coupling to the gravity is uh, below one as compared to the case uh, in Higgs inflation where it is uh, very large. Now, is there any theoretical argument uh, which would prefer any uh, particular range for this uh, Xi? Um, because I, I'm not aware of what you might know. Uh, well, basically, the idea is that, um, yeah, so in the Higgs inflation case, when you have to uh, go for very large values of C, then, um, yeah, there's kind of an unnaturally large value. And when you run your couplings, you see that, um, yeah, you produce um, fluctuations that are bigger than the scale of inflation. Um, so, that is basically the, the theoretical um, problem with with the Higgs inflation case. Um, whereas if your uh, C value is very, very small, and in this case, uh, let's say if it's the conformal value, then I haven't actually checked unitarity conditions for this specific model, but with very small Cs as what we have here, you won't then run into that problem. Your couplings aren't going to go to such large values that your model is not unitary anymore. Mm -hmm. Does that okay. make sense? Okay, more questions? Mm -hmm. 
no on Zoom. Uh, I have an obvious question and I probably asked you already and you answered me already and I forgot it again. So I ask you again, I mean, what would be smoking gun signals for this model at the LHC or any other currently discussed future collider? Yeah, thank you, Tanya. That, that's a very good question. And I don't think you've asked me about this uh, particular model. So um, yeah, when, when it comes to... Basically, um, uh, let's say uh, early universe or inflationary signatures, uh, it is very difficult to tell because, um, yeah, I mean, if you, your observation has to be very, very, very precise to be able to tell the difference, uh, especially when um, um, the scalar to intensity scalar ratio is. Um, um, it's it would be very difficult to distinguish the model from uh, um, let's say any other inflation model, model slow let's say or higgs inflation type model uh, but when it comes to lhc um it would be um again the cross section would be uh, a little bit maybe one order of magnitude uh, below what the high luminosity lhc could probe and the signature would be uh, basically the contributions to the triple Z vertex, which would be, yeah, because it, it is kind of a CP violation that is in the dark sector. So you're not producing, you're not messing with the uh, Higgs couplings at tree level at all. Uh, so yeah, it would have to be at, at loop level signatures and the one that is uh, relative to this case would be the, the triple Z vertex. Um, I guess, yeah, also you, you could have uh, missing ET plus energetic photons, uh, which would be basically coming from a cascade decay of uh, all these kind of inner or dark particles. Um, but all of those cross sections would be below what LHC could probe at the moment, at high Lumi maybe. So there's something still to investigate, so to say. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, more questions from the audience? No, um, no. Okay, so thanks again, uh, Thank for you. this nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for the next speaker. speaker. And please, can you share? Hi, yes. Can you hear me all right? Doesn't seem to be the case. I haven't seen something, but you have to somehow um, make it a bit higher. Or can you can you hear me? Extend it in height, I would say. Um, well, that's a piece around. <laughs> Yeah, full screen, I don't know. Something doesn't look correct. Yeah, I can I can read the full screen, but can you hear me? Now it's okay. I'm not sure that anyone now, can now hear it's me. fine. Now, now it's okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so thanks a lot. So again, uh, we do it like before. You have in total 25 minutes, uh plus five minute discussion, and after 20 minutes I will um, the floor down. So uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about dark matter searches in, in Atlas and CMS. Um, I think I don't have to motivate uh, the point of dark matter. It's very well established that it's something that we want to understand. For me as a particle physicist, the main question is, uh, is it a particle? And in most cases, that question really means, is it a wind? One way of finding that out in the laboratory is to go to the LHC and to look at proton-proton collisions with uh, CMS or Atlas, so large multipurpose detectors. Uh, of course, the point here is that we look at uh, as many proton-proton collisions as we can in as much detail as we can. So that's the multipurpose part. And for us, the LHC has really been uh, performing fantastically over the last years in RON2. So between 2015 and 2018, has delivered to us data sets of 140 inverse femtoborns per experiment of proton-proton collisions alone with a center of mass energy of 30 TeV. So these data sets are just in, in sheer size much bigger and also in, in the energy higher than anything we've had before uh, for proton-proton. So this is really a fantastic tool for us uh, to do physics with and to constrain a new physics and to look for this dark matter particle that exists. 
Now, at the LHC, intrinsically, you're not going to directly observe the dark matter particle. Instead, uh, we rely on an indirect way of detecting it. Basically, we look for collisions where we see particles that are um, that exhibit an imbalance in transverse momentum, called missing ET, PT miss, or I'm going to sometimes say MET. Um, the uh, idea here is that the imbalance is induced by undetected particles, such as dark matter candidates, that leave the interaction undetected and just fly through our detector. And the imbalance then gives us a handle to detect the uh, momentum that was carried away. Of course, this technique completely relies on the existence of additional particles. So you can't just pro produce invisible stuff. And um, throughout the talk, I hope we're going to see that really the choice of what these additional particles are is a very interesting handle you can use to modulate what type of model you can look for. I'm going to show you some examples on the right hand side where you have interactions for different models that produce different final state particles in association with invisible ones. Um, but it also has a great impact on what we do experimentally and how different searches shake out experimentally. So there's a lot of uh, experimental um, nuance to this choice also that I hope I'm going to uh, be able to make um, explainable here. So I want to start very simple um, with models where we um, think about the dark matter interaction as uh, being mediated by a mediator that just couples to quarks, couples to dark matter, and that's the whole interaction. The flagship search for this type of um, final state is typically called monojet. The idea is that we have a, a jet here from initial state radiation it has really nothing to do with the BSM physics. And then we have this dark matter interaction that produces missing ET. This search is enormously powerful. Um, as long as we can generate high missing ET, we really need this high missing ET because at lower missing ET, we always at the LHC, we have to fight jet backgrounds. So we just have enormous amounts of QCD multi-jet production. And of course, if you sometimes mismeasure these jets a little bit, you get fake missing ET, and that can uh, be a problem at, at lower values. So what we do is we go to very high values, and we request our missing ET and our jets to be always very well separated. So you can imagine these events as jets go one way, missing ET goes the other way, and then we can get rid of most of this uh, problem, and we end up with a relatively clean final state. Um, if you think about jets plus met at missing uh, at the uh, LHC, you might not, that might be a bit counterintuitive, but in the end, it does end up being uh, relatively pure. Um, and it's pure in the standard model in terms of Zs and Ws. But those are the main source of background because those produce neutrinos, those translate to missing ET. And as you can see then on the right hand side here, the, the game is then to look at this missing ET distribution where you have this C and this W from the standard model, which is non resonant. And you have a signal in the blue line, which is also non resonant. You have to differentiate the two. So in the end, it all comes down to you being able to nail down the slope of this um, distribution that you would expect from the background. Now, the way that we do this at the LHC nowadays, um, and I said this broadly because this method is used in almost all of these searches, um, is that we use control regions in data. The idea being that in addition to the signal region, um, we also select control regions where we have a lot of Zs and a lot of Ws being produced, um, for example, by going to cases where we reconstruct the charged leptons, um, but we have no signal. And then by comparing um, the, the control regions and the signal regions, we can learn something about the distribution shape we expect. We combine all of this in a maximum likelihood fit. And uh, in this formulation, the great advantage is that really the real observables is not the distributions anymore, but it's the ratios between the distributions. And that means that we can get rid of a large amount of the uncertainty, the, uh, most of it cancels. And even the theoretical uncertainty, we have very good predictions for what these ratio uncertainties should be. So in the end, we end up with uncertainty bands. You can see this here in, in the middle plot in the signal region from the Atlas result. Um, this is like 5% in the tail here. So very small uncertainties, very high precision in the end for, for a search. Um, in terms of results, these types of searches, um, I, I don't want to nail this down too much to one model. Um, this is really sensitive to a broad range of models. Basically, anytime you produce missing ET going one direction, jets going the other direction, this type is going to be sensitive. They're very inclusive. I show you three specific cases here for dark matter models where the limits are always posed in a mass mass plane. So the x-axis is a mediator mass. Um, the y-axis is a dark matter mass. And then the results depend a little bit on whether you what exactly you assume. You can assume a spin one mediator that basically is a heavy Z spin zero, that's basically, uh, in this case, it's a heavy pseudo scalar, but you can also look at a heavy scalar that would be like the Higgs. 
Um, or you go to something a little bit more exotic where you have a mediator that couples in the same vertex to a quark and a dark matter particle. However, in all of these, what they have in common is that you basically always end up with a triangle. So just uh, phenomenology, phenomenologically, what happens is that we're sensitive up to a certain mediator mass that defines the cross section. And then about half of that is the range in the dark matter mass. Because above that, we have this kinematic threshold here where if the dark matter gets too heavy, you just can't produce it in, in this type of diagram. So that's, that's why we're cut off. That's really something that, that is common to these types of models. Okay, and then uh, starting from this very simple signature, you start thinking, how can we expand this program to get more sensitive? One thing that you could try, of course, is you try different types of initial state radiation. Um, clearly, photon is one that comes to mind. And this is also something that we do. And this is uh, also, I think, very interesting uh, experimentally, because you would theoretically, this is very similar to what we saw before. Um, but experimentally, the photon is, is very special because in our detectors, it is really reconstructed in a single place in the detector, namely the electromagnetic calorimeter. So if you look at an event display for this event, it looks very empty. You have the photon and the missing ET. There are some low PT tracks here that no one cares about in this. So they're unrelated in this case. So there's really nothing else to go on except for the photon. If you compare this to a monojet, um, you at least get a lot of handles on the jet. So here you can have tracks for the jet. You see these here. You have electromagnetic uh, calorimeter entries. You have uh, the hadronics. Um, so there's really a lot to go on for the jet. So in the end, you have a bit of a different signature and you have to work a little bit harder for the photon because you have this additional delicate uh, signature. Um, in the end, this works out uh, very similar apart from this particular effect. So uh, in terms of let's say normal backgrounds, quote unquote, um, you now have to deal with Z gamma, W gamma. So it's the same as in monojet, except you have an additional photon. You again can look at these control regions in order to get a handle on what these backgrounds look like. But then in addition, you have fake backgrounds so that you can see here in this signal region part, right part of the plot, these gray contributions here are the fakes. And the photon is either a misreconstructed jet or a misreconstructed electron, and those are significant. And here you have to do additional work in order to estimate how often, for example, an electron fakes a photon in order to do this. Um, and that was right here. This is very nicely accomplished and uh, this challenge is overcome. If you then look at the results, you get constraints on the same type of model that, that I showed you before. And where we just have this initial state radiation. The bounds here are up to something like a TV and a half in the mediator mass. So that's less than monojet but it's still very strong. So especially compared to the results we had before for one, two analyses, um, this is quite a phenomenal um, increase. And then at the same time, the second goal here, of course, is that the photon signature allows you to probe things you're not able to probe uh, necessarily uh, in monojet, namely the interaction, for example, of an, of an ALP with electroweak bosons. You can also constrain that here. So that's an added value on top that you get from this search specific. Then, when you're expanding and you're trying to think of how to better cover the parameter space, the second thing you might want to do is you might want to go from away from dark matter production at all. And you instead try to find the mediating particle directly. The idea being that if this mediating particle covers to, uh, covers to the standard model, sometimes it will decay back. And you can find this by doing resonance analysis. The way you do this is um, you typically look for dijet or dilepton. Um, final states, and you look at the invariant mass of the two objects, uh, the standard model gives you a smoothly falling background. The signal is a bump on top, and you just have to find it. Um, and these two searches are, are both very powerful, and they're a bit complementary in the sense that the die jets typically have a, a higher mass range, have somewhat um, higher cross-section, but at the same time have lower resolution. So you can see the, the signals here are pretty broad. The dileptons, on the other hand, specifically the electron case, they have fantastic resolution, so you can really see sharp signals. Um, but overall, the, the backgrounds and the signals uh, have a little bit lower cross section, so there's a bit of a trade off. When we go back to our exclusion plane um, that we saw before on the left hand side here, so mass and mass, uh, we now have, in addition to our triangles here, um, we have these vertical lines that are on the digit searches here. The specific case that dileptons aren't shown. Um, but they can uh, be similar to the digits or even a little bit more powerful depending on the coupling choice. But what you see is that the uh, resonance analyses have the great advantage that they're not bound by the kinematic boundary. 
So here they are almost not sensitive to this difference and they can also exclude um, above the boundary, which nicely complements the sensitivity we have from the direct searches. Of course, um, one thing that is very worth pointing out, I think in this context is that um, this plot on the left assumes one specific choice of couplings, specifically uh, here, this quark coupling is 0.25. So it's a coupling between the mediator and the quarks. And as soon as you go away from that, the picture can change dramatically. For example, on the right-hand side, the coupling limits on this uh, coupling from monojet, they go well below something like 0.1. So the plot is made up here, but we can exclude far lower. And this region is not accessible by, for example, the dijet search. So there's really a complementarity here. Monojet, good at low couplings. Dijet, good at high couplings. And it really makes sense to do both of them. Now, the other complementarity that I want to mention here is that with the direct detection experiments. So that is between LHC and direct detection experiments in general. And um, here, what we can do to compare is we take our results and we numerically uh, translate them into the results in the plane of the direct detection experiments. And um, we do this under different assumptions for the couplings. We can assume axial vector couplings or vector couplings. Um, and at the LHC, that makes almost no difference to the signal. It looks almost the same. But then when we do this comparison to direct detection, um, we actually get very different results. If you look at the axial vector case here in the top, the LHC results are much stronger over a wide range of parameters. If you look at vector couplings, um, the uh, direct detection experiments are actually much more powerful. So what this really tells you is that there is no single one best experiment unless you already know what the dark matter is. And until you know that, um, you really have to do both of them and compare the results in order to learn something. OK, with that, I want to, for the moment, take a step away from the simplified models and uh, talk about the Higgs portal. Here, the idea is that instead of uh, having a new mediator, the mediator is the quote unquote standard model Higgs boson. And this is particularly attractive experimentally also because there is pretty much a two order of magnitude gap between what we've tested and uh, what the standard model says this number should be. So there's really a, a huge window here where we still have space to explore. Um, this, like everything in, in Higgs searches, rotates around the Higgs production modes um, that have uh, an intrinsic trade off between the production cross section and how easily we can analyze the uh, different modes. For example, gluon fusion is a mode that has fantastic cross section, but is harder to analyze because there's no particles that come with it. So you have to rely on, for example, gluon radiation uh, from the initial state again. VBF and VH production lower cross-section, but come with additional particles, so easier to analyze. And this trade-off in the end works out very favorably for VBF and VH. And VBF in the end is the workhorse here. So this is the monojet of the Higgs portal uh, world. And the uh, topology is somewhat similar in the sense that we still have jets plus missing ET. But now we have these two jets. And the two jets have a particular behavior because they're produced from VBF. Experimentally, that means that you really have to lean into the kinematic selection based on these two jets. And um, we also have different types of background being produced. Once where you have uh, background jets from QCD radiation, it's on the left -hand side here, or this VBF type production mode of the background. And in the end, what you can end up doing is by going to very high invariant masses between the two jets and small separation in, in the phi angle, um, you can get um, an, a great reduction in this Dralian type background um, and enhance the signal but you're always going to be stuck with this, this background uh, simply because it just looks like the signal. On the right-hand side, you can see the money plot from uh, the Atlas result here for full run two. And you can see again, um, which already based on the plot, there are the signal regions, um, but also the control regions. Here, the method is again, very similar. It's, it's used practically everywhere because it performs well. It's very robust. It gives you uh, great results. Um, with that, you can then constrain uh, the branching fraction of the Higgs boson to invisible particles to uh, less than 13%. It's the best signal channel we have, and that kind of sets the scale for where we are at experimentally. I want to quickly mention the VH channel, uh, where we have the production with an uh, additional W or Z boson. Um, you could do this hadronically or leptonically, so we try to cover all the angles. Uh, on the left-hand side in the hadronic case, um, one very interesting result from CMS is where um, we can actually do this search in combination with the monojet search. And the idea being that if you have this Higgs boson decaying invisibly, and you have this W or Z decaying to quarks, you're basically in a monojet final state, except that the monojet now is not a narrow jet anymore, but it's this fat jet that has two quarks inside. 
And then you can use a neural network to um, separate events based on whether they look like they just have initial state radiation from GGH or whether they look like this. And you form categories based on the likelihood of this. Then in the end, you perform three times the same analysis for the same uh, for the three categories. You combine, and that allows you to get a combined constraint from GGH and VH, which is very powerful and goes into the mid 20% range. On the other hand, in the leptonic case, mono Z, where you have a leptonically decaying Z boson, it's very attractive because the Z is a really a clear signal at the LHC, allows you to go to lower missing ET, so you don't have to fight this uh, multi-jet background as hard. And um, overall, you can, with this, get uh, sensitivity to even less than 20%. So I think this is really worth noting because um, it shows you that even though there's much more signal on the left half of the slide, the right half really wins because of the, the, our ability to select and analyze the signal more clearly. So uh, overall, that's a, it's a favorable trade-off. The end goal, of course, for, for these Higgs portal interpretations is to do a big combination of all the channels. For CMS, we currently have this up to early run two, where we got into the mid 10% range. Uh, Atlas already has um, a first combination of the VBF result with the TTH result that I didn't show you yet. Um, where they get down even to 11% uh, already. So that's the current best that we have from direct searches. The main point here is that in both of these plots, we still have channels missing, and we're still going to get better just with the run two data. And that is going to be very interesting because we definitely got to crack the 10% threshold. And the only question at this point is, I think, is how far we can go below. And that is uh, the main thing that, to stay tuned about in, in this uh, Higgs portal interpretation at this point. OK, with that, I'm going to come back to the simplified models for a moment. Um, but now I want to keep going in the, in the direction of larger complexity, because we started simple and we're trying to explore more complex final states. And um, how we want to do this here is that in addition to these simple simplified models, where we have these copies of the Z or uh, maybe a Higgs or a pseudoscalar um, that couples just to fermions, we also want to know, can we have analyses in final states with bosons? This is a little bit tricky uh, theoretically, but one way that has emerged has emerged in the theory literature of doing this is to uh, actually couple the dark matter to a mediator just as before, that the mediator um, now mixes with particles from a, a additional Higgs doublet. So the second Higgs doublet introduces additional heavy scalars, introduces a heavy pseudoscalar, and the pseudoscalar here mixes with the mediator. So you basically get this two hop structure. From the standard model, you go the 2 HDM to the um, mediator and then to the dark matter. And that allows you to have a consistent formulation for boson interactions in um, the production of dark matter candidates. Now, this comes as a, the price, of course, of more additional new particles. So it's more complex um, and also a few more parameters. So the whole parameter space gets a little bit unwieldy. But uh, fortunately, we have the dark matter working group at the LHC uh, to at least um, some of proposed benchmark scans. So we can kind of explore this in predefined directions. But of course, the parameter space between these predefined directions is still complex. The leading constraints that we get here then is uh, from uh, searches with bosons. So um, the way that this typically works is that we now have one of these heavy particles decaying to a mediator and a standard model boson. Um, in the left case, to a mediator and a Z. In the right case, to a mediator and a Higgs boson. And this is a resonant signature now. So that gives us additional power in order to find this. On the left side, you can simply reuse the yes. Z leptonic yes. analysis that we just saw. Uh, you have five more minutes, OK. Thank you. Um, the Z leptonic analysis okay. that we just saw, but now uh, you can look at the transverse mass instead of uh, maybe having to go to a BDT. It's a little bit simpler. And for the mono Higgs, um, you can look at the BDKs, which are the most common, of course, for the Higgs. And this is um, interesting also because the Bs, we can tag them and identify them uh, very well at the LHC. So that is um, a powerful way of selecting the signature. Also uh, in the merged topologies where the Higgs is so boosted that the two B jets merge into one FET jet, which uh, has also uh, gathered uh, significant interest. Overall, when you put all of this on the comparison plot on the left-hand side here, now it's in uh, the terms of two of the boson masses so the mediator mass is uh, still at the bottom here but the heavy mass uh, is uh, on the y-axis. You can see that you get relatively comparable sensitivity between the Higgs and the Z here in this benchmark case. But the thing that I want to really point out is that, again, you run into these kinematic boundaries. So here, the kinematic boundary for this process is this uh, purple line. 
And um, it's again interesting to look for the mediator directly. So in this case, um, by adding uh, searches for a uh, heavy uh, scalar that's charged, um, you get a constraint that does not is not bounded by the kinematic boundary. So you can really circumvent this by adding additional finite states. On the other side, on the right hand side, um, the second point then is um, as you start expanding the parameter space, you start scaling different parameters. Also, the conclusions can change a little bit. And sometimes the Z or the Higgs is dominant. It all depends a little bit on, on where you are. And exploring the additional dimensionality of the parameter space allows you to learn more about where to look. OK, with that, I'm going to come to the last section of my talk, um, where I want to go a little bit into the idea of more complex dark sectors. In everything that I've shown you, I've talked about the interactions between the dark matter and the standard model, but the dark matter is always just one particle uh, vanishes and that's it. But that's, of course, not the full story. One interesting question that you can ask yourself is uh, what happens if the uh, dark matter also has a Higgs, pose, a Higgs mechanism um, in the dark sector? And interestingly, what happens is that then you can also produce this uh, dark Higgs boson that comes out of this dark sector Higgs mechanism at the LHC. Through mixing with the standard model Higgs, this can then even decay into a pair of uh, W bosons. So you end up with uh, this interesting signature of two W bosons and missing ET which again, you wouldn't necessarily have come up with based on the models that we talked about before. So again, it's very interesting to see here how <coughs> the dark sector completion here really influences what we see at the LHC. Um, the analysis then is uh, relatively straightforward. You have to categorize based on how exactly the leptons from the W decays and the missing ET are oriented towards each other. And uh, you do a, a big bin maximum likelihood fit in the end. Um, and the constraints that you get out here are, are very powerful. So also in the TEV range um, for this type of mediator, but in addition, you now also probe this uh, dark scalar. And then the last search that I want to show is uh, probably the most exotic, and it goes in the same direction. Now the question is, what if we don't think about the Higgs mechanism, but we think about QCD? What if there's such a thing as dark QCD? And we can produce um, dark sector particles in a completely boring way as we have done before, um, but they now have a QCD interaction in the dark sector. Upon being produced, they produce a shower in the dark sector that in the end ends up being ends up producing uh, dark hadrons that are either stable and produce missing ET or they're unstable and decay back to standard model hadrons. Um, and the, the fraction of uh, how much of this jet then becomes invisible is, is a tunable parameter. But the interesting thing is that you end up with a signature where you have a jet and missing ET very close together, which is the very thing we tried to get rid of at the start. And then if you look at this distribution, you see that the signal and the dash lines really does look like QCD. So that's exactly what we're trying to get rid of in monojet. Um, you can get around this by looking closer at the substructure of the jet. Um, because some of the radiation is now invisible, um, the, the, the mass of the jet changes relative to the standard model jets, and uh, also its radiation pattern, its width changes, and you can use machine learning to classify this very efficiently. You see this on the left here, where you can uh, separate the signal from QCD. You cut on this, you end up with a mass spectrum that you can fit. The mass is the transverse mass between the missing ET and the jets, and you perform the bump pump again. So after that, it gets a little bit less exotic. So the exotic part does end in the tagging. In the end, you end up constraining this type of model also for a range of up to a few TeV in this mediator. But the interesting thing, I think, is the dependence on the invisible fraction, where you really constrain up to 50% or so, and up here is where monojet lives. So completely com uh, complementary to what we had before. And it's, um, again, the, uh, the behavior of the dark sector, sector really shapes what you should do experimentally at the LHC. Um, with that, um, I would like to conclude. I hope I could convince you that there's a lot of interesting uh, work going on at the LHC in terms of dark uh, matter searches. Um, we have a huge range of searches for different final states and different models that I can't really summarize on one slide. Um, so uh, I, I apologize for that. Um, I hope I could uh, make you excited and maybe you can remember at least one number that's the Higgs portal 10% um, threshold that we're currently working on and stay tuned for how far that goes be, uh, below the 10%. And on the right hand side, the very last thing I want to say is there is a lot to come because many of these searches are still statistically limited. The increasing luminosity that we're going to get in run three and beyond is really going to be uh, great for these searches. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for this nice talk.
Okay. I see Sasha has a question. So Sasha, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. Can you hear me well? Yes. Excellent. So my, my, my question is that if we consider a very simple scenario when dark matter, when mediator do not decay to dark matter, but mediator is slightly lighter than two dark matter masses, do, do you have limits for this scenario? It's, well, basically a very simple scenario, but I, I was not sure that I, I saw these limits. Yes, let me, I, if I understood you correctly, the answer is yes, let me scroll. Um, I think it's here. So you're saying you want a dark matter mediator that is lighter than two times the dark matter. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Like, so that's a simple, that, like simple case, Z boson as a mediator, right? <laughs> okay, well. Yeah, exactly. So I think that would be, that would be basically everything above the diagonal. So there's this, this dotted line here. And everything above this line is what you're talking about. And this is probed by these direct searches for mediator decay to digest or digest chance. I see. I see. There is an echo. Some somebody should mute microphone. But uh, yes, I see. So uh, everything uh, uh, actually should be above the line because the uh, yeah, because uh, dark matter should be heavier than this mediator, right? So okay. Okay. Right. And do you have a sensitivity? Well, it's too many lines. Uh, I uh, kind of. Yeah, so I think for the for the specific couplings that are chosen for this plot, everything here is excluded. In this case, up to, up to uh, let's say, three let's and a half TV of mediator mass is excluded. Um, there are also constraints on this where instead of just excluding mass, we have plots like the one on the right where um, there's a, a coupling exclusion. So you could look up for what coupling this is excluded. And then below some coupling, it will not be excluded anymore. And that should be, for example, around, I mean, definitely around below 0 0.1 or something, because here the digits uh, are not sensitive. I see. It's it's hard to interpret these plots in terms of couplings because you really don't, not, not well, it, it's hard to find, find out what coupling it is. But yeah, because the idea is to essentially to find out what is the limit on the dark matter mass will be if uh, for for certain mass of the mediator for certain coupling and yeah. um, yeah. it's hard to get from this spot but yes i, I think if on the slide here if you click on the link in the bottom you should come to document where this spot is also there um, I can pass it, on, can the pass it on the chat after the chat. Maybe that helps. I would, in principle, suggest a discussion in the coffee break, which uh, sounds difficult, but maybe you can do it uh, then further in the chat. Also, so other questions uh, in the room? No other people in Zoom? So I have a quick question uh, for your slide uh, 17. Uh, I mean, well, let's comment the last line, expect to grow 10% threshold. I mean, if I understand it correctly, so the 11% is from one to plus from one, right? So this would be additional improvement on this combination, or would it be from CMS, or where does this 10 come uh, from? I, so I, I realize now that what I wrote there is, is a little bit uh, misunderstandable. So I was not trying to say that with the run two searches alone necessarily you get to 10%. But basically you take the plot on the right and you add, for example, the full run to ZH and then it will get better. And it will go below 10%. Oh, ZH is missing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, Sorry. so okay. in the end, run one is always going to be- Any questions? Comments? No? Okay. Very, very so, quick question. Uh, what is the uh, uncertainty on the systematics for monitored searches? What, what are the best uh, one can do from the last talk of the session, uh, James? So, Andreas, can you unshare? And James, can you share? Okay. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? No, we yes. can hear you, but I don't see your screen yet. So, I know. Um, yeah. I'm doing it. I'm doing it now, so can you okay. see the screen? Your screen? Yes. Very good. So um, as before, you have in total 25 plus 5, and after 20 minutes, I give you a um, five-minute time. So please, go ahead. 
Okay, thank you. So I'm just I'm, in this talk, I'm going to give you a, a, a sort of an update on the medal, uh, the LHC's first experiment dedicated to the search of beyond the standard model physics, and particularly the future of metal. So the menu for our talk is here. We start with an introduction, then talk about the existing metal detector and the results from run two. And then we talk about the future of metal, uh, the phase one, if you want, is a project for run three, which includes uh, a reinstallation of the metal detector and uh, some physics studies that we will do with that uh, uh, metal detector, as well as the map detector in UA83. And then uh, I'll leave, end up basically with the description of what we can do at, for high luminosity LHC with the MAP2 detector where we move back to uh, our old home, UGC, old proposed home, UGC1, then talk about some physics studies and make some concluding remarks. <clears throat> this is always a long slide. For some reason, it hangs around a long time when I do the page, uh, page swap. But, uh, let's see if it will move now. Yes, it's not moving, is it? No, still, no, we still see there, we, there we go. Okay, so we all know that no new physics, that's probably one big result from the LHD. We haven't seen any new physics yet. Uh, supersymmetry, uh, not seen. Not seen. Left of quartz, not seen. Large extra dimensions, not seen. Fourth generation, not seen. So it could be that there is no new physics, but it could also be that the new physics is hiding in some sort of states. It's hard for uh, the for the existing large LHC experiments to see. And this is what the idea of these new dedicated detectors is, is to look in areas where the large uh, LHC detectors are not particularly efficient. I have, challenging, have a challenge in, in seeing the final states. And these three areas where, are where we have very highly ionizing particles that can be absorbed before they can trigger the detector, Phoebe interacting particles that are not seen by the detector uh, with tiny standard model interactions, uh, very long lived charge particles where the actual nature of the particles not, not it, it, you can't see the decay because it decays too far outside of the detector and of course long lived neutral uh, particles. And with the metal map de uh, detector, we will be looking for a whole host of uh, final states and new physics that's summarized in the top here. And particularly with the map detector, we start to get access to a large of the new dark sector models that we've heard a lot about in this conference. So we'll start, we'll start with the metal detector and results from run two. Here we particularly search for highly ionizing particles, but you also have a little window onto the search for long-lived neutral particles in supersymmetry. So the hip physics here, of course, uh, involves extra dimensions, supersymmetry, magnetic charge, other singly charged particles, multiply charged particles. What we're looking for is highly ionizing particles. These are particles that, with magnetic charge. For example, a single magnetic charge can ionize 47, uh, a single magnetic monopole can ionize 4,700 times more than, the, uh, say, a, a relativistic proton. And electrical charge, a very high electrical charge that could come from cue balls, strange lits, uh, and massive sleptons, where we, do, we don't particularly have a, uh, a high electrical charge, but we have very slow velocity. So the combination of charge and very low velocity gives us something that's highly ionizing and above the threshold for our detector. So there's a whole host of uh, interesting final states that we can see, particularly ma ma magnetic monopoles, magnetic charge, and things like SUSY, cue balls and strangelets, uh, ma uh, stable microscopic black holes and remnants, double charged jigs, et cetera, on the electrically charged side. So there's lots and lots of things that we could possibly see that would be a challenge in some cases, in quite a lot of the cases for the large LHC detectors to see. So we start with the metal detector at run two and uh, more or less what we'll deploy at run three. 
We see uh, in the middle here the Velo detector. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor moving. And around the sides of that, the blue or the blue or the green, whichever way you look at it, uh, are the NTD uh, detectors. And then the these are detectors that detect uh, the nuclear track detectors that detect the damage caused by highly ionizing particles as they traverse the plastic. And then we have the mass, we have the uh, uh, magnetic monopole trapper detectors, which are large volumes of aluminium that can trap highly ionizing particles for later analysis. And then we have a dispersed around this array that we don't really see really marked on this uh, picture, uh, some time picks. Uh, chips to monitor the radiation backgrounds in the uh, metal VELO LHCB cabin. Now the interesting thing is with these devices we have a permanent physical record of new physics. We either have a uh, track in the nuclear track detectors or we have a trapped particle in the trapping detectors. And the other nice thing is there are no standard model physics backgrounds in the sense uh, of back the sense of background I'm using here is a background that that imitates the signal. We do get sort of a background that introduces noise, but nothing that imitates the signal we're trying to see. So what are the limits we've placed so far on, uh, obviously we didn't discover the monopause, otherwise you would have heard about it. Um, but um, nevertheless, we did manage to place very good limits on uh, magnetic charge monopoles. Um, here on the left, we see a summary of our results. Uh, and you see there are two contenders at the LHC. Only Atlas and Metal are producing results on monopoles and highly ionizing particles, so far at least. And you can see that uh, we, the Atlas and Metal are contending uh, basically for one and two charges. Atlas is doing uh, better at the moment because of the very high luminosity, we're at LHCB with a luminosity with something like 50 times down from the Atlas, but uh, uh, nevertheless, higher charges than two, we, we managed to hold sway. And then uh, at run three, we expect to do much better than Atlas. Uh, and also this, this plot will, uh, will get better as we show the results from the complete detector. A lot of these results are from uh, the trapping detector only. On the right, we see uh, what we've done here is include uh, another production mechanism for monopoles, which is usually taken to be Drouillard production monopole pairs. Here we have the production monopole pairs by photon photon fusion. You can see that this pushes the cross sections up so that we actually take, take back the lead uh, in terms of limits on monopole production. We've also, uh, for the first time, produced spin one monopole results. And uh, as we'll see later, we've produced the first results on the search for dions, which are electrically and magnetically charged particles. So the search for the dion was just completed, published in physical view letters. Uh, we, we managed to, to probe up to magnetic charges of 5GD and electric charges of 200E. Of course, the dion can have an electric and magnetic charge in the mass limits about 750 GV to 1.9 TV. Uh, so that's, the, this is it for the dion. And we also looked obviously for monopoles where we don't have an electric charge and we obviously we penetrated up to 5 GD with mass limits slightly higher. And here you see uh, the CERN report on this monopole metal bags are first. And that is of course the first Oh no, this is the first. This is a production of the Stringer mechanism. That's another first, and we'll go to the, uh, the next. Uh, we'll go to that later. But we did get a first there in the sense of the dion production. Uh, dion has never been searched for before in any uh, analysis, uh, experimental analysis. Experiment. Uh, no, no analysis ever produced a result on uh, dion production. So now we move to a, a metal search for monopoles trapped in the CMS beam pipe. Uh, nicely, the CMS beam pipe, the CMS donated their beam up pipe to us so that we could look for trapped monopoles trapped in the beryllium uh, cylinder surrounding the CMS uh, inter intersection point. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence for trapped magnetic charge yet and the publication 
is in preparation. Slight complication there is that the uh, monopole for the first time will be in a magnetic field. So at its, at its home in metal, there is no magnetic field in that metal region, but there is a magnetic field in the CMS region. That means the monopoles can accelerate and even gain energy rather than lose energy in the magnetic field. So the analysis gets a little bit more complicated. Another very, very interesting result that's just come out is the uh, monopoles from heavy ion collisions produced by the Schwinger mechanism. Uh, now, Schwinger mechanism was originally described to, uh, to, uh, to predict the spontaneous creation of E plus E minus pairs in the presence of an extremely strong field, electric field. And of course, in this case, the Schwinger mechanism is using uh, the extremely uh, high fields, magnetic fields of heavy ion collisions uh, to create the monopole, anti-monopole pairs. Um, important benefits of this kind of search is that there are no, it's, it's more like a, a barrier penetration effect. It's, it's, it's not so much, it's not like a drill yan type reduction effect. So there's no exponential suppression for finite size monopoles. Uh, and also the cross section calculation doesn't suffer from the non perturbative couplings, uh, as does the drill yang cross section calculation. So this could be the first time we ever had the chance to see uh, a magnetic monopole if it has finite size, because uh, previously uh, the monopoles have always assumed to be point-like. And when, uh, when monopoles are, are, are finite size, then by the, according to the drill yam cross sections could be quite suppressed and maybe not visible. But in this case, we don't suffer from that uh, finite size monopole suppression. Interesting thing is that uh, heavy ion collisions produce uh, magnetic fields that are much, much higher than they are in magnetars, uh, which is nature's way of producing very high magnetic fields. Magnetars uh, produce fields up to about 10 to the 11 Tesla, whereas fields as high as 10 to the 16 Tesla can be produced in heavy ion collisions. Now I won't talk about the results uh, from, the, from this search that is, currently going for publication, but R2 Regenti will talk about the theory and produce and give you the results in a later talk. Another very interesting area we're currently getting into is where you do have uh, electrically charged particles. They are uh, singly electrically charged particles in this case, but they have a very low velocity. By the beta block formula, they can give you high ionization. And one one example we've looked at here, and there are a few examples now that have been published, is where we have uh, gluino-gluino pairs, uh, where one gluino decays to uh, a neutralino um, uh, with long-lived long long neutralino. And this neutralino decays to a stau and a tau. Um, the stau, again, uh, is metastable and decays as well. And the detection of that uh, involves two things. So, well, involves involves you looking at very long-lived particles, comparatively long-lived particles in the Atlas environment. And when we looked at this uh, using our detector, the metal detector, detecting the highly ionizing nature uh, of the STAL, because it's slow and it's heavy and it's uh, and, it's, and it produces a long-lived, uh, it, it is, decays far away from the intersection point. When we look at this in particular, we see that the sensitivity for uh, detection of this final state is superior at high, uh, glue, uh, high uh, neutralino lifetimes. And, and extends up to reasonably high masses. You could see, for example, on the left-hand figure, we see the exclusion coming from a CMS uh, analysis of this final state, compared to some exclusions from uh, three particular analyses from metal using uh, 20 inverse femtobarms of data and different velocities, uh, beta of one, the beta is a fractional velocity uh, compared to the speed of light. Uh, that's the sort of reddish one, the inner one, 
Uh, the slightly paler one is beta 0.5 and the outer one is beta 0.2. And of course the lower the beta, sorry, it's, it's the, uh, yeah, so the lower the beta, the smaller the beta, the more the ionization. So I think I had that, uh, I have that uh, about right. Okay, so, so metal can cover a long, long life, long lifetime region inaccessible by Atlas and CMS, even with moderate nuclear tract detector performance where the, the uh, threshold of the nuclear tract detector is about 10 times that of a, of a muon, uh, ionization of a muon. So again, we, we, we've seen that, that in certain circumstances we can add to the sensitivity of Atlas uh, at long neutralino lifetimes and uh, with heavy, slow moving particles. So carrying on, these are the other uh, papers that are in pre pre preparation. Uh, search for highly ionizing, high ionizing particles in RUM1, electrically charged particles, uh, and prospects of discovering supersymmetric particles have already been published. Uh, lots of stuff to do. Uh, we now move to the metal map, a millicharge particle project detector project for run three. So this adds the search for feebly interacting particles in the in form of millicharge particles and maybe particles that uh, have uh, interact by their electric, electric dipole moment. And again, we've seen lots and lots about these new dark sector, mode, dark sector models. And uh, we, we're looking here at a, a model that uh, introduces new hidden U1 with masses field A primed, which again, we've seen before, a dark, effect, a dark photon that couples to a massive dark, uh, part, dark fermion particle that's milli charged. And we can get milli charged particle production in this way by the drill yang mechanism. Uh, search for milli charged particles has been ongoing for many years. And here we see on the left in this figure, the constraints from a number of sources, including uh, accelerator sources and a number from the cosmology, like for example, cosmic ray, the cosmic microwave background. And you can see this box marking a nice area where we could perhaps have some sense, we would have some sensitivity at the LHC that would cover this, this uh, nice hole in the exclusion zone of uh, mass of the fermion against uh, the fractional charge log of. So we've got a, a, new part, a new particle detector that we're installing to detect these kind of particles that is part of the metal family, if you want. It's a metal map detector. Initially, we we're going to place it at UGC1, that's some 55 meters away from the interaction point where metal is. And now we're going to, uh, now because of the problems, uh, preparing this, this tunnel for readiness for run three, we're going to move to UA83. Uh, about 100 meters away from the uh, metal detector and well protected from standard model backgrounds and secondary particles by uh, some 40 meters of rock. Although there's 100 meters flight time, that some of that's in tunnels and so on. So it's about 40 meters of rock between this this uh, two metal and uh, this part this particle detector. This is what it looks like. It's about four tons about four meters times 1.5 meters times 2.5 meters. It's protected by a veto, uh, veto layer to reduce cosmic ray backgrounds. Costs of, and it consists of some 400 scintillator bars. It's got a software type FPA, FPGA based trigger and it's calibrated using blue LEDs and neutral density filters to uh, enable us to, to actually simulate the effect of uh, highly of minimally charged particles or mini charged particles or milli charged particles. Together with MAP, which is shown in its UA83 home, we have an outrigger, uh, which is a series of uh, scintillator blocks uh, that in enhance the sensitivity to high mass of the MAP mini charged particle detector. And so you can see this, this, this region, this, re this region has, uh, should we say, uh, complete access and so we don't have the safety requirements of problems that we had in UGC1. And of course, this is filled normally with concrete. We just seen 
these holes exposed. And this, by the way, is a beam tunnel you can see on the far right. So there. Okay. So the map, the mini charge, the mini can sensitivity is uh, shown here for the new UA83 home. So we haven't, even though we've moved back a bit, we're still potentially uh, a well, a capable of producing well, uh, well standard results. Uh, we can see the map uh, sensitivity against mini charged and mass uh, for the mini charge bar detector. That's a big one, and the map. Uh, outrigger detector we just showed you. Uh, we can also get mini, things that look like mini charge or mini charge particles when you have a particle with a with a large electric dipole moment and gives you a very feeble interaction. And we looked at the production of uh, heavy neutrinos, member of the fourth generation lepton doublet. Uh, we can see here the electric dipole moment of the neutrino possible and the mass and its mass, and we can see the exclusion zone that we that we place there uh, using UGC1 gallery. The, so the map to upgrade, we'll look at uh, the high luminosity LHC, and there we will go back to UGC1, which by, by that time we've been brought up to a standard, and we will essentially fill the tunnel uh, uh, with a detector that defines a large decay zone. The decay zone is de defined by a sort of box of detectors, like a Russian doll. Here, is the, here are the dimensions of the detector that, that essentially detect the decays of very, very long particles. And here we see for a benchmark process, we have a B a decaying to some uh, Higgs or scalar state, uh, which decays to two mu. This has been used by many experiments to, 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 as a benchmark we see that uh, we can place quite good results, uh, competitive results, in fact, results that close the gap between LHCB and Methuselah. Uh, so I would say they are complementary to, the, to the, the large collider detector results in those in Methuselah. And you can see that we, we do even better than a lot of the other projected experiments. Bottom, we see the, another case where we're looking for uh, an additional neutrinos from the decay of an additional Z0 boson uh, in a gauged BL model. Uh, you can see that um, on MAT2, we, we really close up the gap between LHCB and Methuselah, again, playing a complementary role. So in concluding, uh, I want to quote Marcel Proust, who said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So. I, like, I maintain that dedicated search experiments provide these new eyes for the, the LHC. Thank you. So that was a nice talk. Other questions? Um, yeah, Sasha again, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. Uh, uh, I just wanted to ask one question about the uh, how long live particles uh, uh, you can detect? I understand that you're detecting, um, well, the aim to detect highly uh, ionizing particles, but uh, how long they should live? Basically, my, my question is, what is the minimal um, distance uh, from the interaction point you can, you can uh, actually access? Okay, uh, so if we go back to from the metal, uh, the idea is, we can detect particles if you look here. Uh, the, this is the seat tau for the neutralino. And that's about, uh, you can see that now. We start to get a bit ability to sort of transcend the standard atlas or CMS analysis to around 10 to the 3 centimeters. Um, I see. But of course, we, we're detecting there using the highly ionizing nature of the stau because it's very heavy uh, and slow, right? So uh, starting well, from about uh, 10 meters, is that, that's what we're... Yeah. Okay. Yes. But when we go to, uh, uh, when we go to map two, for example, which is our first ability to really look for long-lived particles, uh, we can see, uh, we can go to uh, sea towers that go for hundreds of meters. 
I see. So basically, it's very complementary to Atlas of CMS because you're looking, you, you're sensitive to quite uh, very long list particles which yeah. are not accessible yeah. by Atlas or CMS. Yeah, that's right. And so when you look at the, the, if you look at these two sort of benchmark processes, one is this scalar decay from B decay coming from exclusive B decays, uh, again by ducks from the dark sector model. Um, and at the bottom here, where we have this fair production of right-handed neutrinos, a decay of an additional Z0 boson, uh, we can see that the you, you see at the top the, the collider limits and then underneath the Methuselah limits and filling in between uh, the, the, the limits of MAP2 and to a certain extent code, codex 2 and phaser 2. And likewise here, you see that uh, when we go to high luminosity LHD, we nearly do as well as shit. Uh, in this search for the scalar and fill in the space between the LHCB and and uh, and Methuselah. I so see. we always play this complementary role. I'm also very, very impressed that you're sensitive to millicharged particles, uh, we, which is actually quite impressive because I, I didn't expect that uh, so low ionizing particles can be detected by yeah, so metal. Just, yeah. to, uh, just to repeat, uh, again, going back to here, this is going to be installed, so we will be sensitive, and it's part of our run three upgrade. So before, before run two, we were only sensitive to highly ionizing particles, and then at uh, run three, we get this, we add this detector to be sensitive to million charge particles as well. And then for high luminosity LHC, for run four and above, we, uh, we add MAP2, which will be sensitive to long-lived, very long-lived uh, neutral particles. Um, that's that's, that's a very nice complementarity. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, uh, more questions. I don't see any hints. Um, so thanks again for this very interesting talk on uh, experiments which can really probe uh, regions which are not so much accessible to the high energy uh, collider experiments. Um, and I think with this, we close uh, the session. So thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. It is a high energy collider experiment, but it's a different it's detector. Different. <laughs>